real life to stir up your emotions, get some sort of activity uh, happen. And that, that really gets some visions going, some images when, yeah. when that happens. I know. I mean, exactly. You know, Tim, we were just kind of talking about your dream and, and Roy's dream and uh, Charles' dream. Uh, last week, we're, we, last Monday, we're, you know, a little hot, a little diff- difficult. And, and, you know, my wife and I talked about your dream. And uh, I, I want to go into Roy, Roy. What Roy said, too, just a second ago. Do you just want to repeat what you said, Roy, about your dream? Because it my was dream? great. Oh, well, I, I felt like uh, McAfee uh, upset me emotionally. And every time I get yeah. upset emotionally, it stimulates my dreams. I, I have right. very vivid dreams that I don't know. There's not, you know, th- there's not anything really direct there, but it, it will get a dream going. Mm-hmm. And, and, and your dream has a theme that connects to a lot of other dreams, but you need a catalyst to get it going. And a lot of times a projection on somebody, uh, maybe Trump for you, uh, can, can get a dream going that, that definitely uh, is more vivid and you remember it better. Well, you also said you were the little prince that came to earth. Oh yeah, that part, and, I, yeah. I, I felt like I was the little prince that fell to earth. You, you fell know, to earth. The, the thing went- about the little prince is uh, I, I, I have read and experienced myself that people have an innocence. You have an innocence. That the child is innocent, and You're in a world the, of no innocence. The innocent child is protected. It's in, it's not on the earth. It's it's on its star, like the little prince. It's planet, and uh, and that and that's what I feel like. It, it, the little prince fell to earth, and, and 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 he doesn't know anything about the earth. It's just like going to the circus and getting ripped off. You know, it, it's it's a rough place. And you've had a lot of dreams about innocence. Okay? Yeah. And so what you're you're facing is one soulless uh, realm on top of a deeper, more sinister, more soulless realm. And they both have to do with the loss of innocence or something. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and then the 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 little prince is is the innocent part of us, you know that. And what what Roy said, he's going to stay on Earth. He's well, I I feel like even Charles when he he saw ISIS, that's the innocence part. Where he came from, there was an innocence. I mean, there's a certain purity about a, a, a vision of ISIS. But in the other dream, where he went into addiction. It's like he fell to the earth. You know, he's ignorant and, and, and it's just like going to the circus and get ripped off. I mean, you, you don't have, we don't have guides and teachers to help us with this planet. But I think you have a special relationship to the innocent child or the innocence before I, I we're spoiled. You know, I, I mean- I never lost contact with my little boy. I mean, I know I notice a lot of people have lost contact with their little girl or little boy, but I, I never did. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, Charles has something a little bit like that, but it's not the same, not exactly the same. But Tim, uh, the only thing I can say, uh, you know, I, I talked with Amy, my wife, about your dream, and, and uh, you know, we, we were just puzzling about it. And uh, I, I, the only thing I can always say, and and first of all. Uh, what you said about John McAfee and about, you know, Trump too, is anytime uh, we lose the Tao in us, you know, suddenly we're not in, in our conscious attitude. There is a lack of, of the balance of the Tao and we feel an affect. There is, it's a clue that, um, you, you know, I mean, we've essentially sort of uh, what what Young said about the fifth chakra, you know, is when you have those things to get distance from yourself and, oh, look at myself. This is what I'm like when that happens, you know. Now, that, that's, okay, so first of all, I, I don't know what to, 
what to say about it too much more other than Amy and I were talking about it. And I said, the only thing I know is that thing about if we're out of sync with the Tao in our conscious attitude, that shows um, something is amiss. And the other thing is, uh, and and uh, this isn't always true because you know you uh, remember Young's dream about the blood in Europe and everything, and look well, this is this will happen. But on the other hand, um, now that's that's that is means that it is a subjective dream. It's something that's actually uh, is going to occur as a, as a prophetic quality, uh, pr- meaning future something to do with the future but on the other hand i said well the only thing i can say uh, the, the and generally nature produces our dreams so is nature really concerned with current events you know and i always go through a big list of, of the current events young faced in his life you know he went from the victorian age through world war one where eight or nine million people are killed in four years and Europe just totally implodes. Einstein, hyperinflation in Germany, the Great Depression, the, the rise of Mussolini, uh, the Spanish Civil War with Franco, uh, the Soviet uh, Revolution in, in Russia, the, and then uh, uh, the rise of Hitler, and by the way, at the time, the Japanese in China killed about 36 million Chinese people in Japan at that time. I mean, that's sort of uh, unspoken about, you know. And, and then you had World War II, you had the uh, Holocaust, you had uh, uh, the um, atomic bombs dropped. Then you had the Cold War, and then you had the, the Iron Curtain fall upon half of Europe. And then you had, uh, you know, the problems in the Middle East, with Israel, and then China, uh, Chiang Kai-shek loses to Mao Zedong and uh, has to go to Taiwan. And then there's the cultural, you know, well, Young didn't live through that, but, um, well, I think it was in 48 that, uh, that China fell to the communists. So anyway, you got all that. But what, what, what do you think, Tim? What, what are your thoughts about that dream? Are we talking about the... Uh, the, the dream about the, uh, the couple that were racist and then they make a TV show about them. Oh, yeah. It's on all the TV all the time and you don't want to listen to it. Well, the, the way I've settled on it kind of is... is it reminds me of rubbernecking at a at a accident yeah. that we have this kind of fascination with gore yes. and, and even though you don't want to you know something in in you forces to look for something horrible mm-hmm. and um and although nothing in my ego uh really has that that kind of interest i guess something in my uh, subconscious uh, must be really fascinated with that. That's what I'm thinking of. Well, in this, yeah. That that like the, like I mentioned with the Trump articles, why do I click on those things? I already know what's going to happen. And make you mad, make you uh, actually. Right, it just makes me mad. So why go through that? Yeah, that's why I I totally have tuned out news now, now. I mean, I just, you know, listen to classical music or something, anything. Because, you know, I just don't, uh, that's why I tell my wife, it's Christmas Eve. Why do we want to disturb Chris, our, our, our joy that we have at Christmas Eve? But I, the one thing I will say about it, and Roy, maybe you and Charles have a comment, is the second half of it has a trickster quality. Okay? There's something that upsets us. And then this trickster comes in and he's going to play it for you all the time. <laughs> and you're trying to tune it out. So I think that that might be the point of the dream is that um, this bothers you. 
hey, how about if I just play this all the time? And then you experience this nah, 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 like all the time. Maybe it's something that disturbs our peace that we need to avoid. I don't know. I, I mean, I think the only thing we can do is look at the next dreams. Do you have any comment, Roy? I mean, I, well, I just, it, I'm a little lost. I don't know what to it, say. It might have something to do with Tim's past that he's repressed. Uh, there's a link, maybe. That's all I have to add extra. Well, the social uh, justice aspect of his, your family history, right? Tim, didn't you yeah. have a that? Uh, and my wife, um, too, you know, has had that because her father, her mother was one of the original uh, members of the, of the uh, NAACP in Arkansas, white wow. persons. And then she was, was, was woman of the year for the National Organization for Women. And they lived in Grinnell, Iowa, which was founded by uh, 12 UCC uh, Congregationalist uh, ministers who um, Horace Greeley told this guy, go west, young man, go west. That this is These are the guys in Grinnell. And uh, they find it. A, uh, so anyway, it's a tradition there. And uh, uh, I um, very much respect it. You know? And it is some, well, like Joan Baez and the Quakers. I mean, no, it's one thing to hear Joan Baez, uh, you know, being... Uh, political, but she's a Quaker, you know, <laughs> and what do Quakers do, you know, that's what Quakers do, you know, well, anyway, um, did you ever, uh, did you ever get a hold of your father, dream about your father, yet or not, uh, uh, from that woman? Oh, yeah, um, it's, it's just about a line long, I can just pull it out of an email if you want. Okay. All right, well, why don't we, uh, yeah, why don't you get it, and then we're going to discuss, uh, we'll go ahead and read it, and then let's, let's go to Charles' dream and then come back to it. Go ahead. This is about your father. Can you tell us a little bit about your father? You talking to me? Yeah. He, he was the, the, you know, my brother's the sixth generation Methodist minister, so my dad, um, was the son of a of a World War One chaplain. Uh, grew up in Chicago, went to seminary there. Was um, was married and and sent to South Dakota, and he was uh, a military chaplain and a, and a pastor of a of a local church. And then after us kids were born, he moved the family to Berkeley and got a doctorate. Oh, wow. And then That's and amazing. Wrote, wrote a couple of books and, and uh, his first appointment as a, as a graduate was in Montana and that's how we got here. Oh. So he became a that chaplain in college. Fascinating. That's what, so you were raised a, in a very academic household academic and religious and socially, you know, a lot of social action. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely uh, a, a grounding that is uh, going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, really, um, uh, you know, have a great impact on your life. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a, I'm glad you told us that. That's a, that's a that's a pretty important a little uh, part of your background. Yeah, Very that's sort important. of conservative, you know. That's sort of conservative, and, and the conservatives' yeah. religious section they they have some opinions. Well, you know the Methodists. Uh, you you know a lot of the church, Protestant churches that came out of the Northeast. You know John Wesley was uh, one of the founders of Methodism, and. Uh, they came out of the uh, northeastern uh, region of the United States, which were um, very uh, abolitionist. You know, they were one of the one of the real uh, 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 
riveting area, uh, riveting issues uh, from after uh, uh, like the uh, in the 1820s and afterwards was uh, the um, really the injustice of slavery. And it was felt very strongly in, in the Northeast. Now, I don't really know what the Methodists uh, did. They, they're very tolerant yeah. uh, Protestants. Uh, I'm a Methodist, and, yeah. and the history of my town is Methodist. Now, it actually started out in England. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the coal communities and, and sort of a poor person's uh, social movement in the, in the coal labor labor world yeah and, it, and, and the, that, the name Methodist means rest. something too i think i'm not sure but it was uh, john wesley had a sort of a he was almost like uh uh you, you know thoreau or something and his he had a, it was somewhat philosophical and and he uh really didn't have churches for a long time he would it was a circuit rider you know and uh I mean, I don't know. I know a little bit about it. But yeah, why don't you read read your uh, the dream, and then let's let's finish Charles' dream uh, because he it is so important. We got to just find it's 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 energizing him right now. But go ahead. So, so this woman uh, was a an assistant to my dad when he was a chaplain at the college. And when he went off to seminary or to uh, on a sabbatical, she replaced him for a year at the college. I haven't I haven't seen her for forty years, and she just wrote to me out of the blue and said, "Oh, oh I had to scream about your dad." Uh, so, is she approximately his age, or she's a generation younger than him? Okay, so she's about my age. Yeah. So my dad was swimming with a group of men in a pool. When I walked by, he recognizes me and asked me to meet him at a coffee shop. I said yes, but when I got there, I searched the room but couldn't find him. So, it just makes my heart uh, swell, you know. Uh, Your the father, the spiritual father, is uh, is in the unconscious with a, another group of men. When uh, I walked by, he recognized me and asked me to meet him in a coffee shop. I said, yes. When I got there, I searched the room and couldn't find him. It's beautiful. It really is beautiful. I wonder, uh, it'd be just lovely to hear what she had to say when she didn't find him. Yeah. You know, but uh, but it was, you, you know, the one thing is this, is you're dreaming about someone who's passed on. You know, this was some something what like your dream about Uncle Paul, Roy. Uh, and are they really still alive, or am I seeing them? Am I seeing their ghost? You know, I'm not sure. But uh, you know, if it was a ghostly presence and someone that she really, really uh, uh, looked up to, which I assume she did, uh, that. Um, that might explain why she, he didn't appear in the coffee shop. It's like a a, a uh, visitation, possibly. He's going to meet me in the coffee shop, but when I got there, he wasn't there. What do you think, Roy? Yeah, I have dreams like this, and, and it's very much like them. It's like the amaz the amazing thing to me is they recognize me. You know, we, we make a contact. I mean, that, that's the amazing thing. The rest of the stuff never pans out. I mean, I mean you can't play anything. That never really works mm -hmm. out. But that, that, that you see them and they recognize you, it's just amazing. I mean, it's Well, yeah, if someone who, who, from the other world who you had a strong relationship with, who's gone now, speaks to you in a dream, that's very meaningful. You know, and... Uh, where, and the setting is interesting too, in a pool, you know, with a with a group of other men. And she goes by, and there he is, this this uh, someone she someone she looked up to, and and she must it must have been important for her to contact you after forty years 
tell you the story. Uh, when did your father pass, Tim? 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Yeah, and and I don't think they've had much contact. I mean, they probably sent Christmas cards, but... but well, how sure. old was your father when he passed? 80. 80, so he'd be 95 now. And uh, when, so he had been retired for maybe 15 years. Yep. Yeah, well, that's just a, a wonderful... Uh, I mean, it just made my heart swell. I mean, you're going past a swimming pool. You see this this man, and he, like Roy said, those are the two amazing things to me. He's in the pool, he's in a swimming pool, and he recognizes us, and he speaks to us. Those are the three things. And then asks us to meet him in a coffee shop, which uh, I don't know if he's capable of doing that if he's gone. You know, I mean... Um, yeah, but it seems to me... He wants a connection and, yes. and it's going to be in the place of nourishment. Yes, it's in the place of nourishment. It's in the place uh, of, uh, of uh, with, um, with the, uh, an ambrosia liquid, you know, some type of a, uh, you know, a special uh, brew is something brew, is brewed there. You know, there's a, a, a you, you know, uh, he's going to a, she's going to a place where things are brewed, and and uh, that's where she, he wants to meet her. But you're not sure. But you know, can he really get there? You know, my my uh, sister had a dream about my mother, where she was in uh, with uh, her uh, buying. My mother's died on Christmas Day in two thousand. You know, and, and my sister has this dream that they're in, uh, my father's remarried and, and they're in a lens store and they're, my sister's buying new lenses for her glasses. And my mother says, oh, I'll pay for it. She gets out your checkbook and she says, your dad never took my name off the checking account. <laughs> so she can still, you know, cash check, they're right checks and they'll be, uh, well, why don't we uh, talk about Charles' dream? Because I really need more explanation from Charles about the, this dream because it's so, um, you know, uh, it's very cryptic. And yet Charles felt electric when, it, uh, when, when, when he read it uh, or when he had it. And he felt that it was one of the most important dreams of his life. And yet it seems a little, almost nightmarish, a little bit. Uh, do you want to uh, read the dream, uh, Charles? Or uh, I'll put it in the chat. I think I can. Let's see. I know, I just want to say Gary is, I believe, Howard is still out in Omaha, unfortunately. Yeah. I'm going to put the whole thing here. Yeah, while you're putting that in, let me spin this by you. Uh, there's a theory, and it's kind of interesting, that the dead read the living's mind because they don't have any form. They, they don't have a brain. So they're, they, it's, it's telepathy, which telepathy is, doesn't need time or space or anything. So, so they have to use other people's thoughts and sight and touch. And so Merlin could go to a coffee shop and be the taste and the thoughts and everything for Tim's father. I mean, she could do that. It would be interesting. Boy, that's, that's a great comment. Well, you know, here's, here's another thing. Uh, what, what is that um, Day of the Dead in uh, Mexico that they celebrate? Yeah, it's in Oaxaca. Yeah. Well, I mean, their, their philosophy is that as long as there's anyone living that remembers that person or thinks about that person, that they can, they can uh, you know, be close to us. You know, and they often, uh, you, you know, in near-death experiences, they know what we were doing. They kept an eye on us, you know, and, uh, but it, it's just, um, it, it's so, diff you, you know, this, this was, uh, this is actually comes from near-death experiences. 
of, of people that if a, a person wants to go, a, a person who's departed wants to give another person a message. But when they get there, they are so disoriented that they forget what they were going to say. Right? So, so the head, uh, like angel, tells them to just memorize what you're going to say. And as soon as you get there, just blurt it out. Because um, wh like you said, Roy, when they get there, uh, they uh, are so disoriented, you know, that it's just difficult for them to interact at all with uh, the living, you know, very much. They, they might not be disoriented, but they need the living for all those functions. So maybe the living person needs to do that. You know, yeah. they never thought of that. This, they got it in reverse. They're thinking about getting the message from the dead person, but they might not be able to do it. The living person might have to do the message in these things, which they can do. And we're assuming that the dead can do it, but they might not be able to. They might need our functions to do it. Yeah, it just seems like Marilyn needed your father at that point. I mean, it, it, again, you know, who composed the dream? Who composed the dream? Now, sometimes, like young uh, or Amer von Franz had a, a woman patient whose husband died in an accident. And she had like 25 dreams. And she told her that he appeared. And she says, well, in 13 of those, that was really him. No. And so she took those 25 dreams to young and didn't tell him anything about him. Didn't tell him anything about the patient or anything. He just asked her to read. He told her that, you know, there they were dreams about her deceased husband. And he read him. She didn't, he didn't, she didn't influence him at all. And he hands him back to her. Yeah, in 13 of those, that was really him. You know, I mean, so they do enter. Uh, see, here's the other thing is, uh, why do we dream anyway? Is because our threshold of, of consciousness gets so permeable that the dream can come into the consciousness you know and at the same time the dream can come into the consciousness so can the departed person you know like he came into our three-year-old grandson you know my my wife's sister that died in 1974 comes into his consciousness and tells him to tell my wife that she misses her very much you know? uh -huh three-year-old kid doesn't know she has a sister you know but anyway um let's let's go uh first of all let why don't we just read the dream again are you are you read uh charles i think's got a pretty good connection so. yeah, okay because this is hard it. to understand for me but go ahead um hard to understand is in the meaning or just like how the dream goes well yes i mean the 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 fact that it is um, is so impactful on you, so that's what I'm I'm wondering if we can discuss that after you're done. What that you to you tr maybe can describe? Uh, I mean, the the idea of that you felt electrocuted at the end is it, but the dream is uh, uh, an unusual dream. But you're saying that you think it's it's one of the most pivotal dreams of your life. And that, you know, uh, when, and you feel that it's very close contact with God and it scares the shit out of you, what you said at the end. But um, you, maybe just read it real quick here. But um, okay. it, well, I think it's very, we got to, um, we got to really keep to the, the dream when we're talking about it. So there was a cartoon lamb who was on the phone, looked like Lamb Chop on a sort of sex hotline and every time she would say hello this is the hotline she would electrocute herself a little bit and it's almost as if she would like to leave if it weren't for that if it weren't for that electrocution mm -hmm. and um that was kind of making her stay doing the work it was sort of a 
uh, a cue. Electrocution was the sort of cue to, um, uh, you know, say hello. This is the sex hotline. Uh, reinforced the behavior. Made it compulsive. Uh, then it shows a image of another lamb. This is a male, and it is a flat image, but it's it's him. It's not just an image, but he's uh, flat like a pancake, and his body is being smoked up like someone would smoke heroin, and all of his body's getting smoked up little bit by little bit. Eventually, it just gets to only the phallus being left, and a voice asks a question, are you going to stop or continue? And the lamb says, no, this feels good. So continue. And it's obvious that once the phallus is smoked, there's nothing left and the lamb dies. Well, you know, I don't know, after a couple nights difference, this seems like it's uh, starting to well, uh, first of all, what, what we were just talking about in Roy's dream is innocence. And what does the lamb represent? It represents innocence. It can't represent anything else. You know, it represents the innocence in you, Charles, I think. Or, you know, I'm just, you know, uh, starting on this. I'm not saying that's absolutely definitive. <laughs> but anyway, it represents the innocent in you. And now the innocent in you uh, is uh, being confronted with the lack of innocence, okay? So the innocence in you is being forced to do something that, that is absolutely the soulless realm that Roy just experienced. So the innocence in you is being almost uh, forced by some uh, conscious uh, aspect that's, uh, that's has a little electric shock to participate in this um, shadowy realm of sex hotlines, okay? And it doesn't, it wants to leave, but it can't. It's, it's, it's chained there. Okay, that's the first part of this. Then it goes to another one. This is another aspect is the lamb is being smoked up like heroin. Okay, the innocence in us is uh, um, being used as a drug for some addictive purpose. You know, in other words, the innocence in us is being smoked up by an addictive aspect of ourselves until it gets to the life force, which is the, now the phallus is, uh, represents the creative principle. I had the weirdest phallus dream last night. It was just crazy, you know, but it, it has to do with the creative principle. So the innocence is smoked up until it gets to the creative principle. Then uh, the, whose voice is it? The voice is saying, um, we're at a crossroads here. If you keep smoke, if, if this addictive force keeps smoking up the innocent part of yourself, it's going to also destroy the creative principle too. And then there's nothing left. It's total annihilation. Okay, do you want to do it? Yeah, this feels too good. <laughs> In other words, I risk annihilation. I'm willing to risk annihilation because of the autoerotic aspect. Now, I, I think that in that first part of the dream, it isn't really autoeroticism. It is just that there is a, there is the innocence in us realizes that this is not what it should be doing, but it does it anyway, because it's forced to. 
in the second half of the dream, the innocence in us says, yeah, I'm going to smoke myself up until the last, uh, till, till the, till that aspect. Now, now remember, this is so important to Charles to be a parent. I mean, something that's very critical in his life is to father a child so that he can nurture the child in the way that he was not nurtured. It seems like it's his life task. And the way that that's going to happen is through the generative organs of life. And yet this addictive thing has, has smoked up everything except the, the one saving principle in the outer world that's left, the generative organs. And then uh, the, the dream ego, whoever the, the, the flat, the two-dimensional lamb. Now, the reason it's two-dimensional you know, is, I think, because it is, is, is so un-three-dimensional. It's not living a, 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 a three-dimensional life in time and space. You know, it, two dimensions is uh, length, width, and height, you know, and one of those is missing, you know. But anyway, so the first half of the dream is there's some reluctance of, of the innocence is, is um, participating um, involuntarily in, uh, in the, this shadowy world of, uh, of sex addiction. And in the second half of the, of the dream, we are willing to sacrifice our biological existence for some kind of fake high, you know, or some kind of, of, of heroin high. Now, R Charles, how did this relate to God? I mean, what, how, what was your feeling of being close to God at the end of this dream? It was just when I woke up. Um, I woke up like just, you know, immediately as the dream was done and um, I was extremely awake and it was like, I don't know, it was like God had directly sent me that dream and um, it was like the energy of it was still just resonating in my entire being. And um, I was just super, super um, aware and awake. And it just um, um, was very, like, very um, shaking. And you... um, I don't know how to describe the feeling. I mean, it's something that's beyond... Um, it's like it's like the dream of the ET where I'm just confronted with something that's totally not me and uh, it's just um, very vivid and powerful can't be ignored what's God's um, point here I mean to, to me just off the top of my head I'm thinking God is is telling us like he tells me that he's he wants to stir me in every way I could be stirred. I think here he's saying that we are are risking uh, through through uh, the destruction of our innocence, we risk annihilation of of both our spiritual life and our uh, generative life. But what do you think God is trying to say? Um, I mean, I, I would use similar words. I just don't exactly like to try to put it into words a lot of times. Um, because I think the dream already does it perfectly. Okay, the dream does it perfectly. Um, and uh, so you you feel that the dream has a lot of clarity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Roy? Oh, uh, 
Yeah, I, I can relate to this kind of stuff. I, I think the lamb is a symbol of innocence. Uh, and just like in my dream, you know, the, the miners and the deep miners, the corruption, uh, and, the, and the lamb that's, be, that's sort of being shocked to stay in certain behavior, th this is a trance state. This is a bewitched state so that you don't wake up. You're not gonna get in touch with your innocence. You're not gonna get in touch with the, the spirit, the personal spirit. You're, you're kept in a trance because you're not ready to handle that. You're not read, ready to be handled waking up. And, and, and I think what Charles uh, fears or the, the noumena that he gets from this dream is that he's starting to get the idea that He's waking up, and, and that should be scary, and that should get your attention. That's that's place I'm coming from. It's it's just, um, and and Charles, maybe you can talk to this. I mean, w what it is 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 the voice of God is saying right now is uh, that you're at a real turning point that something does action need to be taken or is it just describing that there's a it's this is a critical moment in your life or what do you think um i think it's just a warning um, warning and um i think uh there was just a very, very opportune time uh, for God to send me a particular dream. Um, and that, um, yeah, that was basically a warning. But I, I was going to mention, um, I think the lamb, the female lamb, uh, I think it's interesting that she had actually learned to shock herself. Uh, she was not getting shocked by uh, someone else or something else. And, um, yeah, I think it really describes the, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'd really say the anima, but that part of me is just in a really, like, sorry state. And, um, uh, I can't really like, I don't know, can't really re relate to someone like sexually. Um, uh, my, yeah, my relationships in that regard have been kind of bad and it is almost like, I don't know, the image makes so much sense now that I think of that because I think it is like automatic programmed behavior. I don't know if I've ever really actually expressed myself sexually in a relationship. I think it's all just been like, I get the electric shock and then I just kind of do what I've been programmed to do. I think um, really it's the fact that you are not in your body. You and your body are, I mean, this is not just you, it's, it's a, but the, you, the, you're not embodied. So when, when we're participating in a sexual act, it's, it's hard to say who's in control here. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, the, 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 the consciousness and the body are not one. You know, I mean, I think that's one of the, that's not, that's pretty much was my experience as well. Uh, but um, the, I think it is the anima, you know, the, 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 you got the female lamb and the male lamb and the voice of God. Okay. And in the, in the case of the female lamb, she is uh, the anima in us. The, the conjunctio seems to be very uh, sort of almost a sex hotline. Okay. Our, 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 our sacred conjunctio is being compared with a sex hotline because 
uh, there is not a genuine relatedness between us and the, our consciousness and our soul. I mean, there's not a genuine relatedness. It's sort of a, a I it relationship, you know, and that's why you have the, the, the sex hotline. And then it, that's the first part of it. I'm, you know, I, I'm not saying this is definitive. I'm just, you know, free uh, associating here. And then in the second half of the dream is um, now we're seeing the male lamb, both innocent. One is, and the male lamb, I think, would be us. What do you think, Charles? Is the male lamb you? Or what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I'm not like getting a reaction of, oh no, definitely not. So I think it very well could be. Yeah, and, and it, 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 it's involved with, there's an addict, a, there's an aspect that we would rather be high than be alive. You know, I mean, there's an aspect that, um, being being stoned is is the the pleasure of being stoned is preferable to living in history uh, having a, a a life in time and space you know uh, because um maybe it's just too hard or i think that the the real thing is um i think it also has to do with no relation the 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 fact that we have to relate to our anima and the fact that we are so far away from nature. So our ego consciousness is so separated from our, our natural, our, our body and our, that got, that got the great mother gave us. This consciousness is so sick. It, it's just sort of riding along with it. You know, it's not really um, uh, in synchronized. What do you think, um, Tim? I mean, this is a this is a real riddle because remember how important this is. Yeah, and and it's it's very uh, uh, very visceral. Um, you know, this is at the center of everybody's life, and I think you guys are really onto it. The uh, I start to think of the difference between the first lamb, which is a cartoon image, and the second one, which is is the flattened figure, right? Or is it the... Yeah, flat. Yeah, let you mention. And so it's um, it's more real. It's more present. And that makes me think of uh, just this, this whole situation that all of us mm -hmm. are in, this culture where sexuality is really reduced to its literal uh, physical function. So just like so much of the rest of uh, kind of Western civilization looks at everything scientifically. Well, what is the purpose of this? And, and it reduces uh, human sexuality to a kind of mechanical, natural um, instinct. But there's this much greater spiritual aspect to it. And I think this is what this is pointing to, that um, that the sensation is really easy to come by in a sexual experience. So it's, it's like smoking heroin. And when you get to the, to the phallus, especially, um, you know, it, it has this double aspect. It has this really powerful, uh, it's a, the fount of, of, um, eroticism, which is the thing that makes you come alive. And then after an orgasm, it's just, it's just uh, sort of asleep. And so it goes from these two different states. And, and I think about this when, when the, the fellas gets smoked, all of a sudden the lamb dies. Annihilated. So, yeah. To me, what this means is uh, it's a call to explore what eroticism is about. It's not really about the mechanics of sex. It has something to do with the spirit. 
it has something to do with finding the place in yourself that comes in the comes alive in the presence of a, a beloved object. I hate that it has word. to be I thou. It yeah. doesn't have the I thou in it, which is a sacred relationship, yeah. sacred connection. And it seems like unfolding the rest is, is going to have to depend on Charles' associations with, with what some of these uh, items are. Because, man, if I was looking at this in my life, there'd be all kinds of associations of relationships and times and struggles with certain things. And I just don't know enough about Charles' life to know um, how that fits in. But it just seems very uh, fruitful to be, um, to sort of expand all of these elements individually and find out what the associations are with um, you know, the, with all of the parts. And then, when does God speak? You know, when, what he, he seems to, as far as the warning, when does he speak? I mean, right before the, the, this generative organ, really the only, the only part of our body that seems to not be two-dimensional, not flat, okay? And uh, once we have uh, smoked up our innocence all the way down to this, um, the, the core, says it almost is saying here that the core of our body is the generative organs. And right went before, those are uh, going to be smoked up uh, through uh, uh, this pleasure of addiction, that's when God steps in. And what is, what, what is it he says here? Let's just read it. Uh, he says, uh, he says, um, uh, are you going to stop this? going to stop this now and uh the 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 male lamb says no this feels too good so so i was say that that what we're seeing here is what um is disembodiment and just what tim described is that the um uh, i mean that re really what i think the uh the thing is, when two people have a, a sex and they they are in this um, realm Tim is talking about, they're not having sex with each other. They're having sex with themselves. Yeah. You know, there's no relationship to that. Other. Might as well be uh, put a bag on their head or they're a prostitute or something. You know, I mean, it's an I it relationship. And as Charles says, he hasn't had very um uh, you know, satisfying sexual uh, life. Well, that's probably, you know, is true of a lot of us. You know, the fact that, um, especially uh, if you're very disembodied, you know, I mean, in other words, you're, you're, you're waking consciousness in your body. There's, it's almost like, you, you know, you're not even there. I mean, at least the body's not there. I mean, the consciousness spends all day and doesn't think about the body once, you know. And yet, <laughs> the body is is it's is what created consciousness, and it it is is it is um, it is the creator of consciousness. It's it is what the um, on Earth that the idea is that nature and spirit are separated and that thing that needs to unite them is uh is con ego consciousness you know and i don't know charles um I, I, could you um kind of uh, well roy do you have anything to add oh uh, yeah let, let's let's bring up the little prince again as you said craig the little prince should have stayed with the fox and, and the fox 
w was going to heal it all. He's like the psychoanalysis. He, he says, you know, I'm a wild animal. When I see a little boy, I run. But if you tame me, this whole new process opens. We don't speak. We don't use words. We just meet at a certain time each day. And we, and, and we just sort of glance at each other from the side of our eyes. And, and, and we don't do anything to spook each other. And we do this, I don't know, however long. And, and something develops. It takes time. And, and, and this is, is this, the psychoanalysis process. Th this is the kind of thing that a person needs to heal to get to feel safe where they can embody I mean, it's a wonderful process uh, that was in that book. You know, I, I think about it all the time. Uh, the, it, it takes time to make a relationship. This is the kind of thing you got to do. You can't rush it. You just, a little something happens, and then maybe it happens again, and you anticipate it, and it develops. That's a beautiful process. We become friends, and the fox is, is our body or the earthly aspect of ourselves. And that's so beautiful, Roy, it's absolutely beautiful, is that how do we, uh, how do we establish a relationship with the earthly part of us, ourselves, the body? Well, the fox tells us, you know, it's not done through words. It's done through, uh, through uh, a sort of a wordless familiarity with, with ourselves. And, and it doesn't come immediately. The, the idea of spending time, that was what he said. That's what mm -hmm. it, it takes to tame me, is what he says, is just to spend time. And then he had that wonderful, uh, 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 Marie Valais von Franz or somebody, the wonderful thing about spending time. With me. You, you want to heal yourself, you need to give me your attention and your time. And not be up in your uh, up on your little planet all the time. You know? Now, the what the little prince basically did was smoke himself up like heroin. You know, he decided, no, I don't want to stay with the body. I'm going to smoke myself up like heroin. I mean, don't you think, Charles? That is really what the little prince did. It's tragic. It's just yeah. tragic. I mean, the little prince just smoked himself up like heroin and went back to his planet, you know, in the form of, of uh, smoke. You know, I mean, he had, he had given up his earthly existence. What, that, that's wonderful, Roy. What, a wonderful analogy. What do you think of that, Charles? Yeah, I mean, I think that was uh, very valuable. Oh, yeah. And it's two-dimensional, too. We're two-dimensional. We're smoking ourselves up like heroin because we're doing the same thing the little prince did. When he refused the, the invitation of the earthly aspect of himself, the fox, to tame him. Spend time with me. Spend time with the earthly aspect of yourself. Um, tame me. Uh, you know, get to know me. And we don't do it by looking at each other directly. We sort of every once in a while glance at each other, but it's it's a very um, it, it it is a magical kind of acquaintance, you know. Uh, and the only time you can get that magical type of acquaintance, it, it's just a wonderful uh, analogy by Exupéry. I think. I mean, he's kind of a genius. That's what von Franz says that all these where she dealt with were absolutely knew everything that she was talking about, understood the situation completely, but they could not act. You know, so that was the aspect that they could not act. Now in this dream, there doesn't seem to be any capability of acting. You know, I mean, I think we're beyond uh, at, at this point, Charles, you know, you've had these dreams that are on the edge of the world, of, of a world's ending, you know, 
and this is this is pretty close to uh, the to God saying this. You know, he takes he just showed you the life force dream, the one where the uh, uh, the children were trapped in the. Uh, uh, I wanted to read a, a dream I sent Charles that uh, was uh, so close to that one, but it was a dream. Tim, Tim, did you have a dream or, or Roy? Either one of you? I've got one, but I, th okay. I think it's Roy's turn. You need to what? Uh, I don't care, you know. No, we well, have no. Dreams. <laughs> yeah, we always ahead. have dreams. Go ahead, Tim. It'd be a good way to uh, okay. to solve up. Well, let's, let us let me just read this other dream uh, that I sent Charles. Sure. And then um, uh, we'll... Uh, um, then I want to hear, maybe we can do some sum up, you know, but uh, it, it was a dream that uh, some woman had uh, about coagulation, about, about the fox, you know, uh, just about uh, uniting with the fox. Let's see if I can find it real quick here. Because it's such a beautiful dream. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, the difficult thing with the fox thing is uh, once you tame a fox, then as a little prince says, you're responsible for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the fox says, you're responsible for it. Now, that, that's a hard thing mm -hmm. for a pure attorney. So, you know, it gets to the point they have to take responsibility for taming this thing, for being part of this process. That's, that's probably the hardest thing for a pure but I, I, if it develops slowly and, and with depth, that, that really won't be a problem. You'll be, you'll love them. Well, I think that really, Roy, you just hit the nail on the head on this dream specifically. If we just read what the fox says, I think it's, it will tell us what God is thinking. But now, now listen to this one. It was... Uh, uh, the light of the rising. Now, this is. I'm saying this was related to the dream about the uh, about the children that were trapped in uh, the uh, 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 on the plane of the spiders and snakes. It's dawn. The light of the rising sun is just emerging. I'm up to my waist in a substance that is a mixture of black mud, slime, and shit. There is no one else around, and this black expanse stretches as far as the eye can see. Like the beginning of the world, the first day of creation, I start to thrash my legs, to churn in the black mud with great and persistent effort. I continue doing this for hours, and slowly the primeval ooze begins to harden and become firm. I notice the sun is rising in the sky, and its heat is drying up the water and providing solid earth. I anticipate, anticipate being able to stand on firm ground. You know, and I think there is that aspect. That's been some of the dreams that, that Charles has had. This one here, um, Charles, could you just uh, sort of describe um, how you would characterize this dream? It's a warning. It's a what? Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, trying to explain. Well, I think the first half of dream, the, the female lamb is not so much a warning. I think this, the, the end of the dream is really... Sort of yes, a warning, right? Uh, and You're right. Uh, it's a cautionary dream, um, but I think it's just like it's just one of those dreams where you know God's like trying to say, "Hey, wake up!" Like um, this is like God's trying to show me exactly what's important right now and trying to reorient me in my inner work and um you know god's just trying to 
get me back on track. And um, yeah, I don't know. It, it makes me think of like someone driving and they're kind of dozing off at the wheel and then like, like bang, they like run over something and it wakes them up. Yeah. I think that, that this is, um, you know, if it was an E Ching, it's got, you know, two, three line segments <laughs> and expressing the Tao of our situation right at this point. And uh, this, this is what God is doing is he's giving us a picture uh, in this double image of where we are right now. And you, I think that the, the aspect that it was so powerful is, is it's like he rang the bell of our current situation and it rings true and our and within us we know this rings true you know and that this is this two-dimensional uh cartoonish life we're living is uh you, you, you know is just is that it is a two-dimensional uh, flat cartoonish world of addiction and uh, uh, and um, sexuality uh, without embodiment and where the ego is so far away from the body. And God compassionately is, uh, is just trying to wake us up by showing us where we are. So uh, you, have you ever had dreams like that, anybody, that where he shows you exactly the disoriented place we are right now? You know, this, this is where you are. You know this is not the place that you're supposed to be. Well, you know, like when God tells me, I'm going to stir you in every way you can be stirred. Because he knew that I was such a procrastinator and a person who never took action on anything. So he wanted to um, really, uh, he was gonna do anything he could to get my attention. And I think that's what Charles is experiencing here, that God will do anything he can to get attention. Okay, is there any um, final words on the dream from anybody? Uh, Roy or Tim or, um, go ahead Charles. I just want to say, I, uh, um, I don't know, I think it's interesting that it uh, is, the dream is using like lamb chop and a cartoon lamb in order to get through to me. Um, I think it just, um, it's an example of my sort of lack of human relatedness sometimes. Have more, okay. it's a puppet. more, yeah, and more feelings to towards like inanimate objects and fictional characters than I do real people. And yes, uh, yeah, but you've had some, uh, uh, you've had some powerful uh, human dreams too. But a lot of the anima, in, like in Roy's case, where he has these uh, um, wonderfully. Uh, animal dreams, you know, uh, they're just so beautiful because the animal is this shaman animal and they're just so deep. I think in, in uh, some of your dreams, Charles, there is an aspect of the undifferentiated feminine presence within you. You know, it's just undifferentiated. It needs to be differentiated. And the only way it can do it is heal is through relatedness, which you're going to be trying to work on. I think if you get win that auction, and then uh, through uh, he's trying to he's going to do some active imaginations with a cabbage patch doll, which I think is is fabulous. In other words, you talk to that you you can talk to this you can talk to the the cabbage patch doll genuinely, you know. That, that's what I, I actually had an act of imagination this morning. I, you know, I asked each one, I said, who are you? Where do you come from? 
and tell me why I'm such a phony. <laughs> I really do that because I feel phony when I go in there, you know, and I want, can you please tell me what I am doing? I know this is just not genuine. And, uh, you know, anyway, uh, Roy or, or Tim, do you have any final comments? No, I, I'm eager to hear what happens after this. Yes, you know, I am too. Process, totally. Yeah, yeah. So what is this? Oh, yeah. He, 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 did you see uh, Charles? I hope you win. Yeah. God damn it. And Craig, I sent you yeah. an email. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. You know when I'm going to. My wife, you know, will we'll put money on a $500 million lottery. Uh, and she says, did anybody win it? She says, and I said, yes, they did. And she says, uh, oh, well, who was it? And where was it? I said, I don't care. That was our money. <laughs> I don't want to know what they did. Who it is. Okay. All right. I'm going to put this in a thing. Because we are already usually have it spent before we <laughs> how did you spend a half a billion dollars okay this is i love the just the title on this one okay i'm gonna i'm gonna put it in one paragraph at a time how about that yeah i'm not sure i can get it all in one okay just parts yes all right i'm gonna put it in one paragraph at a time this is the first paragraph and then here's the second paragraph. I love it. This is a, a this is like some of your dreams of old. It's very. Uh, when did you have this one? Just last night. Oh my god! <laughs> it's unbelievable. So fresh. I mean, that's why I say sometimes on on somebody's more uh, uh, you know troublesome dreams that I, I just. You know, I'm just clueless on. I say, well, let's hear the next one, and then maybe we'll know something, and then we put it in a little bit of context. Yeah. But maybe this will establish context too. On this, let me see if I get this control. There we go. Okay, I think I got all three parts. So go ahead, uh, Tim. Okay, I'll go ahead and read it, and we should probably yeah. just take it in bite sizes. Yes, have to. The church tower is called. There's a seasonal change and we are taking all the old folding chairs and stuff from the church that used to be outside and putting everything away. Chairs go in one big container, the hymnals in another, etc. I find a bunch of loose items and have to squeeze into tight, into full containers to put some of them back in the right place. There's much activity, many things are out of the place out of their place. By the time it's over, I finally make it to the choir meeting and everybody is dispersing. That's second, happened before in a, your dreams. Go ahead. Yeah. Making my way across the courtyard, I join paths with a young woman I've seen before. She greets me and says that her name is Vanu. I recognize that she runs some outfit nearby but I appreciate that she reminded me of her name. She's wearing a long, tight dress. As we walk, she talks about how she's very slight and bony and has, and she describes her body. Um, and then she has me feel parts of it through her dress as she's talking about how bony she is. I know that she's gonna ask me if she can model for me, but she never asks and I don't answer. Eventually, we get to the bottom of a ladder, and right nearby, there's a fellow leaning out of a office, a law office window. Before closing the window, he sees me and says, "Hi, Tim. Nice to see you, Terrell." Using both my names, so Terrell is my birth name, and, Ter and Tim is my nickname. I follow Vanu up the ladder attached to the outside of a tower. And in the third part, we climb several stories and her very long dress starts to cover my head. When we arrive at the top, I try to untangle myself, at which point the dress is kind of like a turban. 
we're in a small room I, and a small room with openings. So it's the top of the tower, but there's some kind of a ceiling or something. And in the middle of it, a small table with four church women sitting around it, finishing a meeting. They look up at us and before I can free my head from the dress, they see me. Okay, we climb set and there's a long dress that cover her very long dress covers yeah. my head. Yeah, okay. All right, well, uh, let's just start going through it. First of all, it's called the church tower. Uh, this is now... Uh, one thing, let's just remember that we had a lot of these very um, sensual uh, dreams of women. Then it became uh, uh, more uh, ethereomorphic or animal-like, then very abstract. And then we had what seemed like a real shadow dream. And then we come right back into this richly imaged sensuality of uh, a, a dream with the, uh, with um, basically, I would say something close to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the goddess of, of women or something, you know, the, uh, there's just some aspect of her that she's, other than she's bony. Let's, so let's just go through. Now, first there's a seasonal change. So it's going from, uh, now, is this, uh, it, so So in other words, uh, we're taking all the old chairs, folding chairs and stuff and putting everything away. So um, it's it's going from summer to fall is what I'd think. Is that right, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're not going to be sitting outside anymore. You know, and uh, the chairs go into one big container, the hymnals in another. And then there's some other loose items and um, we have to put them somewhere. So we just put them in these full containers to put them in the right place. There's much activity and many things out of place. By the time it's over, I get to the choir meeting and everyone is dispersing. Now this sort of reminds me of that uh, fair that you were at, remember that one? Yeah, you get there and everybody's leaving. Yeah. At, at the, so, and there's been other times when you seem to be get there as everyone's leaving. But anyway, the, yeah, this first part of the dream is um, is a uh, that there is a transition from uh, the summer to fall, and the things of summer are being put away, and uh, uh, we're busy working on this seasonal transition, something that we miss so much. But we're uh, in our, uh, you, you know, our, our modern day life, the seasonal transition. But anyway, we're, um, uh, we are participating in this. So uh, let's just think that that's the thing is we're getting ready for autumn. You know, what happens in autumn? It's harvest time. It's uh, uh, the time when, when the fruits are harvested, okay? And we're doing this in somewhat of a sacred place. And then, uh, uh, so the church or this sacred place is, is um, preparing for a, a, some autumnal thing. I, I don't know where I am right now in that. <laughs> so we'll go to the next part. So that is from this, that, okay. All right, the last sentence, I get the choir, everyone's dispersing. So now we're making our way across the courtyard and we join paths with the young woman I've seen before. She greets me and her name is Vanu. Now, do you know anyone named Vanu? No. Okay. Well, it almost sounds like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a very ethnic name anyway, or some magical name. Yeah. And uh, um, I recognize that she runs uh, some outfit nearby or some store nearby, but I appreciate that she reminded me of her name. Okay. She's wearing a long tight dress, which is interesting, you know, at church. She says she's very slight and bony. And as she describes her body, she has me feel parts of it through her dress. 
she is very lean. Okay, so what does it mean when a woman is very lean? Usually means she's very spiritual. You know, a, a lean woman tends to be very spiritual. Uh, and uh, she says she's, uh, you know, other lean women uh, are, uh, are um, horse women. You know, I don't know if you've ever been involved in the horse world, but all the women are very light very slight. Okay. Um, uh, I know she's going to ask if she can model for me, but she never asked and I don't answer. The anima wants to have this special relationship with us and this creative thing we do, which sort of defines our ego uh, in the outer world. And she seems to want to have a relatedness to us, but she doesn't say anything. Okay. And, uh, so when we get to the bottom of the ladder, where was the ladder mentioned before? It wasn't. Okay. When we get to the bottom of the ladder, there's a fellow in a nearby law office window. So you're actually, um, let's see. Yeah. Anyway, well, let's just go with it. Um, the ladder, it feels like I'm, I'm headed home and the ladder is on the path. That's okay. Yes. Okay. So there's a ladder on the path. So it's a, it's, it's a horizontal ladder, not vertical. Okay. Going up the side of the tower. Oh, going up the side of the tower. Okay. So then, and when we get to the, there's a fellow in a nearby office window and before closing the window, he sees me and says, hi, Tim. Nice to see you, Terrell. So there's some uh, person in a legal office that knows who we are and uses both our names. We follow Vanu up, oh, okay, so here it is. So you saw the tower and the ladder, and that's when we get to the bottom of the ladder. In other words, we get to the place of crawling up the tower. Um, you've seen it, uh, and we, uh, and there's a fellow in a nearby law office window who sees you're gonna about to climb up the tower, and says, hi, Tom, nice to see you, Terrell. Now, <laughs> He uses your uh, given name and your nickname, which is, you know, interesting. So now you follow this magical woman up the ladder, this lean woman, and uh, it's attached to the outside of the tower. You climb several stories and her very long dress covers your head. Uh, when you arrive at the top, you try to untangle yourself at this which point it's like a turban. So it's actually wrapped around your head, almost like uh, a, a Indian turban. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we uh, come to a small room with openings and a small table. There's four women sitting around it, finishing their meeting. Something to do again with the spiritual realm. Women in a church meeting, uh, you know, and, a, and another woman who, uh, leads us up a high tower. <laughs> Isn't this funny? The woman leads us on an ascent to, uh, uh, to the top of a high tower, enters this room where there are four wo women seated, you know, and then they look at us before you can free uh, your uh, head. So the fact is, uh, what I think has happened too is, is that the, the woman's uh, dress has become your thoughts. You know, there's a, some aspect that it's become your thoughts. Okay, now I, I spent way too much time on it. Roy, what do you think? We're having a little bit of tornado warnings, but I just ignore. Uh, I this this seems like a theme that Tim has. Uh, I call it. He doesn't have a clue. Uh, first, uh, he's concerned with what other people would think because he's being responsible. He's helping the church pack up. And then, and then this lawyer guy sort of is checking on him. And then the church women at the top. Uh, and then he, he says, well, you know, this woman probably just wants to be a model. You know, he doesn't have a clue. He's actually sec secretly intrigued and, and the woman's working it. Uh, and, and Tim doesn't have a clue 
and he has this uh, pressure on him. Uh, so so it, it, it's comical to me. You know, I, that's how I see it. I mean, I, I could see this. This is a classic Tim dream. Okay, can you just tell us, though, what do you think is going on? Uh, uh, that, that well, the, the, the animus, the the animus trying to seduce him, but he doesn't have a clue. You know, he doesn't get it. And he's also concerned with what other people think. That's come up a couple of them. You know, oh, like, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This okay. is classic. So that's stuff. what you mean is that the anima is trying to have a relatedness with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, now, what's interesting is she, <laughs> she's, uh, she wants us uh Okay, yeah, I hear yours. Entangle, entangle. Yeah. She wants, she, yeah. she wants to entangle your crazy head in in the reality of the feminine world. You know, your head is is needs to be is it needs to needs to stop being in your head and it needs to uh, be wrapped with the the feminine and so that you are living in the earthly feminine realm. Yeah, I mean I'm just uh, I think it, we can express this better next time, but um, uh, that's beautiful. Okay, and you, you see, you hit on it too. Is she wants us to feel our, her body? She describes her body. You know, she's wearing a long tight dress. She's not wearing that for comfort. I don't think. You know, it is is a dress of seduction. You know, and then she is going. Now this is. This is a very, now remember the woman that went to find the Spiritus Rector, okay? Right. Also, also, yeah, she also yeah, made an ascent. Not when I was too too afraid to go up the stairs. So I think but, I'm making progress. <laughs> yeah, this time you went. Well, I, I think the, the you, you know, the most surprising thing about the dream, and, and I think one of the most important things about the two is that you, three, you go up the tower with her, your head becomes entangled uh, in, in her uh, feminine uh, persona. In other words, she's saying you're, you know, it's like a snake that wrapped around our head. You know, like it just wrapped around her head. This, the, uh, that your head needs to be wrapped up with the snake. You know, it's too cerebral. And then you come in and here again are four women, you know. Now these four women, um, uh, you, you're quickly trying, like Roy said, to untangle your head, you know. Should we have done that? I don't know. Well, we're going to have to discuss a little bit uh, next time. But Charles, what do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't leave you much time. Um, first of all, I love the uh, image and symbol of uh, that the seasons are changing. I, I just, for some reason, absolutely love that. And I think that's just such a perfect way of saying that, like, you know, like the times are changing in the individual's life and a new season is being entered. Um, so real i wouldn't say it's it's not as like big of a change as like how in my dreams i have like literally the world is coming to an end and a new one is beginning but this is you know uh an uh, like a natural life progression stage uh to where um you know you're gonna have to adapt to different conditions um there's gonna be positives and negatives um I I see like um, the dress entanglement as being like I don't know it, it made it's like she puts gets this turban on your head and it's the, basically like you're wearing the garbs of the anima and like the turban you're finding and she's trying to give you a new way to think a new way to be a new way to present yourself that isn't so western and like you know literal and something a little bit more uh spiritual and uh um i don't know you know let's just say eastern 
something that's more related to the unconscious. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I would have to agree with Roy a little bit. This seems like a classic Tim dream. Well, yeah, yeah just a, a little bit of, of uh, you, you know, a disconnect between, uh, it's like we're off a beat, you know. Uh, I, we're going to have fun with this dream. Tim, do you have any final comments? I just think this is going to be a fabulous dream to go through. Well, go Gerald, I appreciate that you threw off the Eastern comment because that's that leapt out at me. I think that's there's something important about that. Yeah, and and the fact uh, he described it much better than I could is that the anima is saying uh, is wrapping our head and said you you need to think more like the anima and not like Tim, you know. Yeah. And, and it's also very important. We need to know what tarot means, the fact that that was spoken. But anyway, Roy, do you have any final uh, comments? Okay. All right. We're going to have a lot of fun with this dream, don't you think, Tim? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know I am, but I, I think it's going to be good that we can uh, sort of digest it too. Well, anyway, Charles, we're not completely done with your dream yet either. So I'm probably not even with Roy's, but... Uh, We'll see you all next time. Thank right, you for right. the little prince thing too, Roy. You're a genius. <laughs> okay. We'll see you later. Bye, guys.